chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. So if you'd like to read it out of your Bibles, yes, if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word. Revelations chapter 6, starting with verse 5 through, uh, through verse 8. Revelations chapter 6, 5 through 8. Revelation is a unique book. There's a, a lot of uh, um, symbology in it, um, but there's a lot of literal. So uh, we're going to be talking about the symbols that God has given us to help uh, create the picture of what's going to happen. All right, Revelation 6, 5 through 8. And when he looked, the third seal... When he, I'm sorry, when he opened the third seal, I heard a third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do no harm, do not harm the oil and the wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice from the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And so I looked and beheld a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed, followed him. And the power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Thank you. Thank you for standing for God's word. Again, we're talking about the shadow of the horseman. And you know, um, uh, just get uh, thinking about the horseman and the nature of the horseman. Realize that, uh, in, that in that time, a uh, person that came into town uh, had authority many times that rode a horse. And we know that the generals and the leaders of the Roman Empire, whenever they came in, um, came into uh, Rome after a victory over their rivals or their, those enemies, you know, they came riding in on a white horse and they'd have a parade. parade. Also, the horseman represents the speed in which things happen. Um, th thinking of the pandemic, the part that we're a part of even now, and uh, there was a time when we weren't as quite as uh, uh, as international as we are now. Well, let, me, let me complete my thought in that: is that we've seen this thing start in Central Asia and, and rapidly have an effect through the whole earth. And there was a time when it, that would have been greatly slowed; it would not have been as with the speed that we saw that happen. And so I believe that's another reason for the horseman being a symbol of things to come. We know now how fast things can start in one area and completely have influence over the whole earth in a short period of time. And so I believe that's one of the reasons that the, the Bible uses a horseman. And we had talked earlier, previous, about the one on the white horse representing the, um, the, uh, the Antichrist and his influence and his uh, uh, way of doing things. And we know about the... Uh, also, the red horse talking about the violence, and we we again we see it on the news daily about how violent this world is and has become, especially in the last few years. And today we're going to talk about the black horse and also the the pale horse. And you know I'm not here to to uh, create uh, doom or fear, uh, but rather this is knowledge, this is light on what's going to happen. We have to remind ourselves. That Jesus, the, the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any soul should perish. Amen. It's not God's will for people to perish. In other words, uh, He's not created, uh, help, or seen this, the, the atmosphere that we're in so that He can bring judgment to the earth. It, it has happened, but it's not His pleasure to bring judgment. In other words, He has no pleasure in the judgment of the wicked. But God, again, we talked about last week, God gives us a choice. God's about choice. He gave Adam and Eve a choice. He gave his children, the children of Israel, a choice. And he made it clear. Joshua made a statement that said, Choose you this day who you will serve. And we know that those people had been under the influence of Egypt. And they uh, under the influence of serving other gods. And he said, Choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, this, and God has given us a choice. God has given this world a choice. And you know, by choice, people have rejected God. Uh, it's very clear uh, the blessings. In other words, in Deuteronomy, there's a there's a chapter dedicated to the blessings that follow those that believe it, that put their trust in God, that serve Him wholeheartedly. He said, "Blessings will overtake you if you just serve Me with your whole with your whole heart." And and other, and also, if you reject Me, then these these curses they'll overtake you. So God makes it clear we have a choice. And so, because this world has chosen to reject Him, judgment is coming. So we need to be aware that Jesus Christ is coming and He's coming soon. We need to live with a sense of urgency this morning. Amen. Because it's easy to say, well, I'm doing all right. Me and mine are doing okay. And so uh, we're satisfied with that. But we live in a world that is not ready for this. This community is not ready for this. And so we want to be a light during this time. 
the third seal, the black horse, speaks of, of uh, inflation and famine. I, I was looking at this statistic, just getting ready for the, the message this morning, and, and in 2019, 10% of the U.S. family's budget were spent on food. And that's, that's over the, over the, that's 10% of everybody, and, and that was, to me, very low. I thought it'd be much higher than that. And I realize in cases it is higher than that. But 10% of the budget, that's an all-time low. I, I would have said it'd been closer to 20 or 25%. If you got teenagers, teenagers at home, it is 20, 25% of your budget. I realize that fluctuates. But in this culture that we live in uh, right now, roughly 10% is, is uh, based on food. Uh, our budget is on food. But the Bible says a day will come when a man will work all day for a quart of wheat. Now this is corn. This is a, this is a grain that uh, is a little more familiar with us here where we live than wheat. Uh, as most of you know, all for baking goods or bread and so forth made out of wheat. That was a staple during the time of Jesus. And just to, just to know, um, some of our translations that uses the word corn in, in Scripture referring to grain. That's an old English word for grain. In other words, during the time of Jesus and the people in that realm, uh, it was wheat and it was barley and it was rye. Corn was a, an American crop. The Indians over here were growing it during that time, but the Europeans and the people there in North Africa were growing wheat, barley, and, and such. So uh, just, just a note, just a thing of, of interest. But this is, um, again, this is a quart of corn. Right now, you can go down to the Circle H or a lot of these other stores and you can buy a 50-pound bag for $7.99 or 8 bucks. A 50-pound bag. There's roughly 3 pounds of corn in this jar. And the day, will come, the day will come when a man will work all day for a quart of grain. And three quarts of barley, which is a cheaper grain. If you were a slave or if things were difficult, or if you were very poor, then you would tend to use barley as your grain. But to, uh, a whole day's wage in a quart of grain. That's, that's hard to imagine right now. But the Bible says that day will come. And we do know that war disrupts agriculture. We know that... Um, Natural disasters disrupt agriculture. And we know that um, we see, um, I work in the weather, so I watch weather. Um, excuse me, first started farming in 1984. And so I've, I've seen a change since I began farming. And you know, you can talk to people here in the southeast and say, weather's different. You can talk to people in the northwest, they'll say, weather's different. Matter of fact, uh, the chief just have a daughter that's out uh, helping with the fire relief in Oregon. And so we know it seems like every year they're having these severe fires. Why is it? Because of drought. And so we're flooding in the east and burning up in the west. And then you can talk to people in the northeast and they'll tell you the seasons have changed. And I'm sure worldwide we can hear the same story. So we know that things, that's the way things are right now. What happens when we get closer to that uh, hour that we're talking about? I feel like things weather-wise have become crazier. So this is very realistic. All right. A, wage, a day's wage for a quart of wheat. Most of us in this in this area, we know what it, we don't we don't know what this is talking about. In other words, we've not experienced the the, the, the amount of hunger that we're talking about now. And some of you can say, you know what, Brother Chris, I remember when we ate the same thing day in and day out. We ate greens, we ate cornbread, and we had syrup. That's what we had. And some of you can relate to that. But you had greens, you had cornbread, you had syrup. And you know what? There's a day coming when that when that will be scarce. Amen. There's according to the Word of God. To put this in perspective, during the time of John the Revelator, a day's wage, a denarius, some translations call it a penny, that would buy 12 quarts of grain. In other words, a normal day, if they worked all day and they got that denarius or that penny, then that would buy 12 quarts of grain. So it's talking about increased inflation. Why? Because of the scarcity of the commodity, the commodity that's out there. Just to put that in perspective. And then the Bible says that hurt not the oil and wine. There will be, during that time of, of, of scarcity, there will be those that are rich that will take advantage of the poor. Always is during times like that. The super wealthy, according to what we understand what the scriptures tell us, <clears throat> would not be affected. So we know the reality of today, the reality of right now where we're living now, is that famine is, is global and it's growing. We understand that. Uh, we, go, we walk into the supermarket and uh, at Walmart or, or, or uh, Publix or some other place, and there's a vast supply of all kinds of food. I mean, the produce racks are full year-round of all kinds of things. The meat racks are full. The, the bread racks are full. And, and we have seen a change in that since COVID. We realize that you go to the local store and things are not as, uh, as full as they have been. But as a whole, we can get what we want 
And sometimes we have to wait for it. But the Bible is saying the day will come when that will change. Because this is the deal. Prosperity and wickedness does not go side by side for a very long period of time. In other words, when we, when we as people, as a culture, uh, turn away from God, well, what's the result of that is wickedness. And whenever wickedness uh, takes root in the culture, then God begins to judge that culture to get their attention because He loves them. He said, look, uh, look, uh, I am the source. I am the strength. And you know what? He begins to, to have impact that culture. And so He will impact this world. Uh, they, they're, they're thinking of their own self as being sufficient, but God is in charge. Amen? God is in charge. Every day, over 200,000 more mouths to feed. Same amount of land. We're not, we don't have any more land. As a matter of fact, uh, and again, this is one thing I do know about is agriculture. We know in this nation, we're not careful with our land. We're developing our land. Every day, land is being developed, and that means less farmland, and we have more lives each day to feed. So we realize... Uh, we realize there's going to be a there's going to be a train wreck, as we would say. And Jesus and the, Jesus spoke to us in the time of Revelation about that. This is a terrible statistic. Um, the Amer America throws away 17.5 billion dollars worth of food each day. 17.5 billion dollars worth of food today. A day. We were up in Memphis a few years ago uh, doing a missions trip, and there was a time when um, there would be different ones that would take, uh, for instance, your restaurants that serve buffets, and they would take that food at the end of the day that could not be sold and give it to the to those that were homeless, those that were displaced or whatever. But, you know, the laws are such that's more difficult than what it used to, so they can't. You know what I'm saying? It's much better to put it in than throw it away. They, it's much better to put it in the hands of those who need it to get it distributed to the shelters and so forth where people are down. I mean, they need, they need that. They're, they're glad to have that. So even, even it's, it's because of laws. It's not because people want to do different, because some of the laws that we put in place. But that's just one example. 44 million thrust into poverty, poverty in, in, in uh, recent months. So we realize that, hey, this is, this is, this again, this is a shadow of things to come. You know, uh, thankfully, we do live in a nation of abundance. And we don't spend, a, you know, probably the average American does not spend a lot of time thinking about food. But let me tell you from an agricultural standpoint that the, 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 the agricultural industry in the U.S. is fragile. It, the, the debt is high. Again, we're dealing with changing weather. We're dealing with a high, high input costs. And our, the reason that it's only roughly 10% of the budget is because our commodities are cheap. I'm telling you, agriculture is in a squeeze right now. And again, uh, this is what we're talking about where I'm at. And you can talk about other areas in the nation that are singing the same song. And so, again, it's a fragile, it's a fragile situation. Um, years ago, two generations ago, you had a lot of small farmers that were producing the food. Today, you got fewer and fewer and fewer smaller uh, farmers producing the, the food to, to, to reach a higher population. And so, uh, if, for instance, the pork industry is more corporate. So if you have a, a, a big company go down, it's a large share of the, of the meat. In other words, it affects a, a greater portion of the market than it did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So that's what we're talking about. Again, um, again, um, not to uh, place fear in your heart, just so that, that you realize that, hey, the urgency of the hour that we're living in. Amen. It's no time to get lax like the five virgins that weren't ready. It's a time to stay ready. Watch and pray. We know Jesus is coming. We realize that global markets, they have a, a, a greater impact on our economy, more so now than just a few years ago. And again, this is setting the stage for things to come. America and the world is uh, racing for an economic ruin. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 and 50, it says, look, at the, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food and abundance of idleness. In other words, they didn't have to work all day, 12 days a week, to get, or 12 hours a day to get their job done. They had time of idle or leisure. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. They took advantage of the poor that were around them. And you know, there are nations around us that, um, again, they exploit the poor. There, there's um, missionaries in this area that I believe it was Haiti they were going into. And half of what they carried in there, they had to give to the government. In other words, uh, half of their goods that they carried in. So we realize there is nations that want to help those that are in need. They want to help 
of people, in, but the governments of the people that are there are stifling this. Amen? So this is part of the, the, the trouble that we're looking at. And so we realize because of that, again, we see more poverty and more starvation. But we still we need to, the way the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 21. Proverbs 14 and 21. It says, He who despises his neighbor's sins, but he who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. In other words, we need to have compassion on those that have less than us. Proverbs 14 and 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy to the needy. The Bible tells us also in uh, Proverbs 19 and 17, it says, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what has what he has given. In other words, God wants us to be, have compassion in our life. I believe the message that Brother Joey Gordon, what was it? We need to care. We need to care. And that's what the Bible's telling us about. We need to have oh, we need to be compassionate to those around us. We need to consider those that have less. We need to uh, uh, John the Baptist. What John the Baptist said, if you got two coats, you give one away. And I'm telling you, that's not a real popular preaching, but what he's saying is that we need to be mindful of those around us. Amen? Amen. God will repay what we give to the poor. Is God good for, for that? Yes, He will repay what uh, what is given, what we give to the poor. God's good for it, and this is the saving grace of the church. The Bible Bible tells us again in Proverbs twenty one and thirteen: Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. And so, you know, uh, we can't um, obviously we cannot save the world. But we can we can help with those that we have influence those that those needs that we come in contact with we can help with those we can be of assistance we can uh, take a step and you know what God will help us Amen. and you know it, it, the, the things that we've done here we've had uh, we've had a mind of what we want to do we had kind of a plan put together and we said to ourselves well for instance the hand uh, sanitizer for the teachers man we, how are we going to get enough hand sanitizer to get all the teachers we got a call. Somebody called and said, we've got this hand sanitizer. All you got to do is pour it up in a smaller container. That's just one example. When we take a step, God will meet us there. Amen. God wants us to reach out to those around us who do not have uh, adequate supplies. Amen. And you know what? America's time to cry is coming. And we pray that God will hear us. Amen. We have, we have experienced as a nation a great level of prosperity. But again, we cannot go contrary to God's will and God's plan and to the laws of God and experience prosperity. Those two will not stay side by side very long. God never intended the government to feed the poor. That's the job of the church. It's no coincidence that the poorest nations are anti-Christian. There's no coincidence to that. The poor of the world are the responsibility of the church. And most of the world uh, that are very poor, the third country... Third world countries, as we call them, have few Christians and fewer churches. So churches. So it's our responsibility to reach out to those that are around us. And why do we do this? Is why we do missions because Jesus Christ is the answer. This is why uh, we did wells in Africa. That's why we've been a part of that because there there have been, it, it, it's a great struggle of life for those to have enough clean water to run a household. And you know what? Uh, they're serving the same gods as the generations before them. I'm telling you, I'd be the same. I'd be doing the same thing if that's where I was at. If I would have been born there, I'd be doing the same thing. I'd be serving the gods of my ancestors. And so instead of having to carry water a long distance, unclean water that's uh, bad for their own health and the health of their children, uh, we go in there and we dig a well, and they have clean water. They place it at a church or a Bible uh, Bible school. So when people come and say, why is it that you came here to dig a well? It's because you know what? God has been good to us. God has been good to us. We have clean water where we live and we want you to have clean water where you live. And you know what? But then those those walls that those walls of, 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 of doubt, those walls of, of not knowing uh, what this Jesus is all about, they begin to crumble and their hearts begin open to the gospel. Amen? Uh, that's, that's, that's why we do missions. It's because, and God is opening those doors for us. Amen? And so we need to take advantage of that. Amen? But thank, thank God the Christian future is not famine. It's a feast. Amen? The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 9, Then he said to me, Right, Blessed are those who called or who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These things are true. These are the true sayings of God. 
Amen. You know what? When we're ready, when we're giving ourselves to Jesus Christ in this world that, again, is, is going contrary to that. We see the wide road is full right now. The narrow way is, is not crowded, amen, but the wide road is full. That leads to destruction. If we keep ourselves committed to Him, He says, you know what? We're looking for a marriage supper of the land. I'm thankful that I don't have to worry about a famine. Am I concerned about it? Yes, I am. But you know what? I'm not dominated by that. I know that I'm looking for a marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. I believe soon and very soon we're going to hear that call. We're going to hear that trumpet sound. And we're going to be taken out of here. And, and, then, and we, want to be, uh, we want to make sure our friends go with us. We want to make sure our neighbors go with us. We want to make sure this community goes with us. We want to make sure those that have not heard the gospel uh, have an opportunity before that trumpet sounds. Amen. Amen. I'm looking for a feast. There's no mention of what's on the table, but don't you know it'll be good, amen? If grandmother can cook a meal that'll uh, make you want a little more, what can the Son of God do, amen? What can the angels of heaven do, amen? I'm looking for a feast. I'm looking for a time where we can sit down and rest a little while. I'm looking for that time of fellowship. And we understand how important fellowship is during this time. We've had to be separated for, for a period of time. But I'm thankful the Bible says in the book of Revelations there'll be no more sea. There'll be no more separation. There'll be no more separation from Christians. There'll be no more separation from our loved ones. There'll be no more separation uh, from those that we love and we care for. Amen. There'll be a time of fe unending fellowship. Amen. A time of celebration. But you know what? He wants that table to be full. And so that's why we want to make sure that we tell others about Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ took two fish and five loaves and fed how many? 5,000 people. Amen. So we know that he can take care of us no matter what the circumstances are. Uh, whether we're down here and we see tight times or whether we're, whether we're at the marriage supper or supper of the Lamb, Jesus has got this. The Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 23 and verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. I'm thankful that he is our shepherd this morning and he's going to take care of us. Amen? Amen. Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding feast. The earth's resources failed, right? They ran out. They ran out of wine. But you know what? He multiplied it. And he said he would not drink of the fruit of the vine until that kingdom came. And I believe that's soon. Amen. We're going to again have a time of celebration. He's kept the best wine for last. In other words, it will be a time of celebration. I want to be ready. Amen. 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 The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 8 that we just read. So I looked and beheld a pale horse. The name of him who sat on it was Death and Hades followed after him with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. We talked about the red horse, the violence. We know that uh, when, we, when we think about the scarcity that the, the Bible refers to whenever a man will work all day for a, a quart of grain. What's he going to do with family? What's he, how is he going to feed his children? If you're in a two-income house, you're looking at two quarts. Well, how are you going to support your old, the older people that cannot work? How are you going to support our children? Amen? It's going to uh, cause create great unrest. We realize, no doubt, that will be a source of the violence. And again, peace will be taken from this earth. In other words, we do the Prince of Peace influence, the solid earth is influenced right now. But when that is taken out, Whenever that spirit of peace is taken out, there's going to be violence. Uh, we've seen it from time to time in our country when uh, maybe uh, 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 an area is shut down because of roads or what bad weather and things begin to get scarce. Some people just absolutely go crazy over that. My brother told me of a scene there in Buffalo. They had a, a freak snow uh, storm and uh, the power was out uh, early in the year, way, way before that normally that sort that sort of thing normally happens. And they brought a uh, a load of generators in there because people were without power. And he said it was a terrible scene. People were just going crazy because of the, the fear of being out of power. So we realize uh, that can happen now. But what's going to happen when the spirit of peace is gone? So we know that violence at people's lives can be taken. We talk about the famine where a man will work all day just for a little bit of grain. Uh, that's going to cause unrest. It's going to cause famine or, or death from starvation and just the violence of, of people struggling. And uh, um, the, the battles among the, the race, uh, between, well, again, against uh, uh, nationalities and so forth is going to increase. So we realize that death is the only thing to follow. 
It represents death in unprecedented portions, proportions. Many of the people will die. Hell is close behind the pale horse. Death receives the body. Hell receives the soul. This will be death's greatest day. Again, this is not, this is not God's will, but this is what happens whenever we choose to reject Him. This slaughter will be by sword, hunger, and beast. We realize the pestilence. We Again, we can know uh, just, uh, for instance, this COVID-19, this pestilence that's come. We realize that uh, something like that can come or something even greater. Man has created enough biological weapons to destroy the world. We've got it in place right now. No doubt that man has created. Again, those that, in other words, there's a spirit of God that's keeping everything in, um, in check. The, this is a pale horse of death. God, but you know what? That's not God's will. He created, that was not his original plan, I should say. God created everything and everyone to live forever. He created a perfect world and placed man into it to enjoy it. The, the, the pale horse had to look on through the garden until sin entered in. That's right. Before that, there was no death. God did not intend it for it to be dead. In that kingdom to come, there will be no death. We live in this in the, in the influence of this fallen world. At the very moment that Adam disobeyed God, sin entered paradise, and that pale horse cast his shadow over the earth. And he's been riding hard toward us ever since, and he will come. But I'm thankful we can be saved from that. Amen? We can be delivered from that. We can be ready for that day. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as one man, as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because all sin. So we find the earth was cursed. Those of you that try to grow something, um, you, you don't have to encourage a weed. <laughs> the bugs don't bother Leaf disease doesn't bother It grows on its own. Many of the weeds are not only a, a, a pest, <laughs> But they're poisons. Many of them are poisons. Matter of fact, one of the jobs I have uh, coming up, we'll be digging peanuts as soon as it dries out. We got a weed out there that's poisonous. In other words, we, we bail the hay afterwards and feed it to our cows. It's poisonous. So we got to take care of it. We got to pull it out. I'm thankful there's a day coming when there'll be no more weeds. Amen. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more uh, death of any kind. But you know what? That's part of the curse that we live under. But one man brought it in, but one man's going to reverse it, that being Jesus Christ. We see the ruins of, of, of kingdoms. Um, I heard on the, I just listened to something talking about the uh, Egyptian uh, empire that lasted over 2,000 years. They were powerful for over 2,000 years. That's a long time. But you know what? That finally came to an end. The Romans are likewise. But you know what? We serve a kingdom that has no end. Amen? We have a, a God that we cannot trace out back. In other words, He's always been. He always will be. His kingdom is strong this morning. And that's the part of the kingdom that we're a part of. My citizenship is not here in Vernon, Florida. It's in heaven. I'm just waiting to move. Amen? I'm waiting on my new home. What about you this morning? Amen? We, we have a record of the Great Depression. Some of you remember uh, the Great Depression. Some of you have heard your parents. I heard my parents both were alive during that time. They told of that time whenever uh, the economy, the U.S. economy failed. And so we realize that has happened and it will happen. But you know what? We serve a kingdom that the economy will not fail. Amen. As a matter of fact, they use gold to pay the streets up there. Amen. The gates are a pearl and the, the foundations are a precious stones. Amen. I'm thankful. I'm not looking down. I'm looking up. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us of things to come, but we can have hope in the midst of that because my hope is not in this world. Amen. I'm not holding tight to this world. Yes, I live in it. I work in it. But I'm not holding tight to this world. Amen? It's appointed unto man who wants to die. Even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He gave up His life so He could experience death for us. He took that death for us so that we will not have to. We, I, you know, I think many of us in this room are going to going to see the rapture. Amen? I pray all of us see the rapture. I pray, I pray all of them. But with some of them may pass here before that uh, where our body, our spirit will go and then our body will catch up. But thank God that Jesus Christ took the penalty of death so we do not have to experience it. Amen. We can experience the rapture because He took that penalty of death. He died in our stead. We're not mourning the fear of death. We're here to celebrate life. Amen. Celebrate, celebrate life. The Bible tells us in, uh, in um, John 10, 10, it says, The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. That's where we're headed this morning. Jesus Christ said, I am he who lives 
and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and hell, or Hades and death. In other words, that pale horse, he's trotting. That horse is coming. But he, Jesus Christ controls the pace of it this morning. Amen. He has the keys to death and hell. And I'm thankful this morning. He is, again, he's stronger than death. Amen. He's stronger than the curse. We sing that in one of our worship songs. He's, he's stronger than the curse. And so I'm looking to him this morning. I'm looking to that time when I'll be in his presence where the curse is gone. Amen. 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 I'm thankful he has the keys to death, hell, and grave. We celebrate a kingdom that will not fail. We celebrate an economy that will never collapse. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4 and 19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. I'm thankful, I'm thankful for our government, but my hope is not in the government. I'm thankful for all the things that we've accomplished but as a nation, but I'm, I'm proud to be an American, but I'm thankful to be a citizen of another country. That means more to me than my citizenship here. Amen? We're here to celebrate life that will never end. The oldest living thing on earth is a bristlecone pine named Methuselah in the mountains of California. 4,700 4, years old, but that's just a blink to eternity. Amen? I'm thankful that's where we're headed this morning. The shadows of the horsemen are covering the earth, both the white, the red, the black, and the pale. But the Bible tells us in, in Psalms 23 and 4, it says, Yea, though I walk through the shadow, of the, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen. Your rod and your staff comfort me. That rod was to defend. That, that shepherd had that rod to defend the, the, the creatures or the people or whatever might come against those sheep, want to take their life uh, or to steal them. That rod was there to protect them. That staff was there to keep them in line. Whenever they got in that uh, hole or in that thicket, he would use that a shepherd's staff to pull them out to him so that they would be safe again. And I'm thankful that this morning we have the great shepherd. He is here to protect us. He's there to keep us. He's there to keep us uh, to, to himself. And you know, uh, again, uh, we talk about misconceptions. We talk about uh, those that are around us. Uh, talk about, we mentioned earlier about some feel like they have sinned so much that, uh, that, that God cannot or will not forgive. That is not true. He came looking for me, just like that last song that we sung this morning. He came looking for me. Death, death has a plan to stick us in the ground to separate us from God. But you know what? He came looking for us this morning. He loves us. The reason that God created us was to have fellowship with Him. Amen? We were not, we were not brought into creation for Him to pour His wrath out on us. That's the choice that we make. We were created to have a, a community, community with Him, to have relationship with Him. My wife and, uh, wife and I were married 11 years before we had a, a child, before a baby come into our family. And you know what? We had a strong relationship. We had a strong family when that happened. But when that child, when that child came in our life, it, it added a new dimension to our family. I and mean, then it brought fullness to our life. And Jesus, uh, the Bible tells us in Genesis, let us make man in our own image. Why did he make man? So he could have communion with him. So he could have fellowship with him. So he could... Uh, and, uh, um, not only experience the worship of man, but he could bless that man and he could uh, just interact with that man. That's the, that's the reason God created this. And you know what? That's why he created this world to have fellowship with, to show his love, to show his character, to show his goodness. And it's sad that there's so many have taken away of Satan that they, they, they've rejected the God that loves him for the Satan that wants to deceive them. Amen? But our, our mission is to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why we do outreach. That's why we do missions. As Sister Teresa talked about earlier, that's why we intercede for those that are around us. Amen? To, that we say that prayer intercession. Abraham interceded for Lot, and Lot was spared. And you know what? I believe God hears that prayer this morning. I believe God hears that prayer of intercession this morning. Amen? Amen. The shadow of these horses don't scare me. I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. But rather, it tells me that our time is short. It tells me that I need to be about the Father's business. I'm telling you, the easiest thing in the world is to get so uh, buried and so bombarded by the cares of this world that we live only for ourselves. It's so easy to do that. 
It's so easy to, to be uh, so caught up in the, in the everyday news and the everyday ongoings that we uh, forget about the reason that we're here. We're here to live to glorify God. We're here to be a light to the community that we live in. We're here to intercede for the, the, the community and those around us that are lost this morning. Amen? That's our purpose this morning. And it's easy to get off track. I'm telling you, it's something uh, we have to be intentional that we keep this mind. The mind that Christ had, he said, I'm, a, I'm here to do my father's business. He was sitting at that well side. The other guys that went in to uh, get bread and meat. And they said, Jesus, aren't you hungry? He said, I've got meat that you don't know of. In other words, the reason that I'm here is to reach that lady that we just talked to. This lady that the world was down on. The lady that thought she had no hope. The, world, the, the lady that had to go through the heat of the day. Whenever, when everyone else was at home doing their household duties, she came in a heat of the day when everyone else was gone so she wouldn't hear the sneers and hear the jokes and have the fingers pointing out and all them odd looks. She didn't want that no more. She couldn't deal with that no more. I'll go through the heat of the day where no one will leave me or everyone will leave me alone and I can get my water and get on home. I don't have to put up with that. But Jesus Christ came looking for her, amen? And that's where we're at this morning. There's a lot of lost ladies just like... Uh, in the in the uh, story, there's a lot of uh, lost sons right right outside our door. There's a lot of lost lost daughters and, uh, and sons that we'll come in contact with through the course of a week, and we need to realize that Jesus Christ wants to bring them to Himself. Amen. 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 And that's why we have the Book of Revelation to tell us of those things yet to come. Christ is coming. The Great Tribulation is reality. The shadow of death may get our body. But hell doesn't have to get our soul. Amen? Amen? I may give up this flesh before the rapture. But you know what? He's not going to get my soul because I'm going to put my trust in him this morning. Amen. Amen. And Brother Greg begins to play. We need to search our hearts. Are we ready? Are we ready for that day? Are we ready for his calling? He's made a way of escape. Jesus said, can't um, for us to live in a way that we found worthy to escape those things. What things is he talking about? These things that we talk about today. The coming when God's going to pour his wrath out on this earth to reveal who Jesus Christ is, the Son of God. Those days are coming. Are we ready? That's the question this morning. Are we ready?